Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next session. This is uh, Digital as a Driver of Europe's e uh, Economic Recovery. My name is Sam Fleming. I'm the Brussels Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. It's great to be here and to have this excellent panel to discuss uh, the digital recovery here in Europe on this very rainy Brussels day. The complex uh, task of creating the recovery fund certainly dominated 2020. It did for me and uh, the rest of the Brussels media here, but this is the year where we'll see whether it was all worthwhile. Uh, member states are currently drawing up their recovery and resilience plans, uh, which they're going to use to pitch for their share of the 750 billion euro pot for the recovery fund and digital is going to be a huge uh, element of it, no, no less than a fifth of it if the commission gets its way uh, as the continent embarks what it hopes to be um, a digital decade, uh, its own roaring 20s, hard to imagine in these very difficult economic climate that we're now living in, but that's that's the vision. Anyway, all this is needless to say uh, easier said than done <coughs> and that's why we have an excellent panel to discuss some of the complications and difficulties, as well as the challenges and opportunities uh, for Europe's digital future. Uh, let me introduce our superb panel, first of all. Uh, Celine Gower is uh, Director General of the Recovery and Resilience Task Force, which uh, the European Commission set up in August of last year to oversee the implementation of the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which is the engine of the, the 750 billion recovery fund uh, that uh, the European Union agreed on uh, in a summit last uh, July. Fernando Ferreira Diaz is the Director General for Economic Activities at the Ministry of Economy and Digital Transition in Portugal which of course is the holder of the uh, rotating EU presidency at the moment. So wonderful to have you here as well. Uh, Norbert Lutke Entrup is the head of technology and innovation management at Siemens, where he is responsible for over overseeing uh, the company's portfolio of technology and innovation. Uh, Damian Burselager is a German Volt MEP, who's a member of the European Parliament's RRF, uh, Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, negotiating team, so a key player in this uh, story as well. Uh, and then Jürki Katainen is the president of Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund, and also a com former commission vice president for uh, jobs, growth and competitiveness, and former Finnish Prime Minister, no less as well. So, uh, as you can see, a wonderful panel to have with us. Before we get uh, to the opening questions, I'd like to uh, turn uh, to you, the audience, uh, and uh, offer our audience poll. We'd great to have, love to have your feedback as well, your thoughts on this topic. So let me ask the question, um, which of the following areas is the most urgent digital spending, spending priority in your view? Um, we have A, digital skills and education, B, upgrading health systems, C, modernizing the public sector, D, renovating the building stock of Europe, um, E, rural connectivity, or is there something else? So please uh, give us your answers uh, via the interactive feature and uh, we can come back to the answers a bit later. Now, let me start with the panel, uh, and I'm going to start with Celine Gower from the European Commission. Uh, with around three months uh, before the deadline for member states to submit their national plans, uh, Celine, you're in charge of, of helping to oversee uh, the Commission's response to these plans, working with the member states uh, on those recovery and resilience plans, of which, as I said, digital is going to be a key element. What's the state of play for these national plans? What strengths have you seen and what are the areas of concern? Thank you very much, Sam, and good morning to you, to everyone. I'm very happy to have uh, the privilege of sitting in this uh, very distinguished panel to discuss this important, uh, important topic. What is the state of play? Well, state of play is very much a work in progress. All the member states have started uh, working on their on, on their, on their plans, but none of them uh, is uh, is quite uh, there yet. On the positive note, uh, I see well the very very constructive uh, work that has gone on uh, between all the member states and, and, and the Commission in the last uh, in the last six months. I think this has uh, started as immediately when the, the proposal was uh, was uh, was made uh, and uh, and has really been seen in a in a spirit of a joint endeavour and, and and cooperation on on both sides. And I think that's an extremely good sign for the for the future. It's been given really top priority uh, by by all the all the governments, and and we see that in the level of uh, of engagement. On the on the positive side as well is the very high degree of agreement on the substance of uh, of what should be in the plans. The idea that is enshrined in the in, in the regulation that that you have to have those plans as an engine for the twin transition, so digital and green transition, and preferably the two of them together, 
uh, and an engine for resilience and making sure that our economies uh, come out stronger from this crisis than 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 the way they were before. I think there is a very very high uh, degree of, uh, of of convergence in in this, and that makes the work uh, very um, well more easier in that to that uh, to that degree. When I look at the at the draft plans, they are obviously at very different degrees of uh, of, of mat maturity, but in all of them, digital is already very very uh, strongly featuring. This is helped by the 20% target on digital expenditure that is in the, in the regulation and which you referred to. That is also helped by the flagship projects that the Commission had uh, had suggested, really focusing the, the efforts on skills, on public administration, on connectivity, uh, and on uh, upscaling the, uh, the technology. Looking more in detail, a lot of skills uh, measures in the uh, in the plans, digital education, but also a better connection between the education itself and 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 the upskilling of the of the workforce and the labor market to make sure that we are also filling the skill gaps that we that we see in the digital field. On the public administration, it differs, and we'll come back to it between the different member states, depending on the degree of uh, of digitalization that they already have. But but we do see a very strong move, for example, in the health uh, domain, both on on health data and health record, in that in that respect. And finally, on on connectivity, as in connectivity, there is a strong uh, desire of the member states not to crowd out private financing for, for example, for 5G, because in a number of areas, some private financing will do the trick, uh, but where we have a need for public intervention, for example, in the in the rural area, to ensure that connectivity is for, is for all, uh, we see a very, very strong uh, will of the member states to step in. Areas of concern, well, I would like to say more uh, points of, of vigilance uh, at, uh, at this stage, I would, I would only name, name two. First, reforms because reforms are absolutely key uh, if you want to digitalize. I think digitalizing uh, in, in itself will, will never solve anything. You have to do it also with a, with a, with a deep thinking on, on, on how, for example, the administration uh, operates. And, and, and secondly, uh, there, there are a lot of bottlenecks for investments uh, and that we, that we see in, uh, in almost all the member states. And those have to be tackled and have to be removed if we want to make sure that the investment is actually reaching, uh, reaching the economy and, 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 and doing the recovery we, we want. And finally, and that's probably my, 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 my concern or my biggest uh, point of, uh, of vigilance, timing. So in putting up recovery plans for the next five years uh, to that magnitude and with of, of that, uh, that that amount of, of money dedicated to it in uh, in only a few months is a huge challenge uh, and and we are we are clearly uh, struggling and, and running against the, against the clock in that uh, in that respect in particular for those less fancy issues like the implementation and the everything will be in the implementation in the ability of having proper milestones proper targets uh, and, and and proper structure to implement the plans if we want them to be successful so that's more kind of the engine room of of, of the of the plans but uh, but it is a really important one if we want them to deliver thank you thank you uh, plenty of us uh, for us to come back on there that's a very helpful overview uh fernanda ferro diaz can i ask you um about portugal's uh, position on this obviously the portuguese presidency has put uh, digital at the center of its list of priorities, how is the presidency going to promote uh, um, and ensure that uh, spending priorities are coordinated in order to achieve the maximum impact and contribute to a stronger digital single market? Well, um, thank you so much for being here today. And um, I would like to tell you that um, on the, the, the program of the Portuguese uh, presidency has three main priorities, and of course, um, digital is one of one of its priorities. It's one of the five action lines that we uh, intend to deliver. Um, well, during the Portuguese presidency, the um, European semester has been temporarily aligned to um, the deploy of the recovery and resilience facility. And for that, the country-specific recommendations will be used to identify the challenges uh, that the national recovery and resilience plans should focus on. As such, the um, European semester will then provide a framework to identify national investment priorities. And for this, the Portuguese presidency will organize several debates um, one of them uh, is already in the Competitiveness Council on the 25th of February. Uh, linked to the European semester, we will have um, a discussion on how the Competitiveness Council can effectively 
contribute to identify a number of areas and actions that it considers crucial for the short-term recovery and long-term resilience. Like Celine said, we, it's a matter of timing as well. So this is a proposal of the Portuguese presidency. It, um, member states should do so by uh, linking together mutually reinforcing reforms and investments. And this is uh, important that it's done this way. They um, should act on the different and strictly interdependent areas that contribute to the digital transition. And these are, for example, um, investments helping SMEs to adopt digital tools or uh, to interventions focused on the human capital, connectivity, simplification, digitalization of services, etc. And this should be all worked out together. So um, funding is also important, of course, and we have this uh, uh, huge instrument, but mobilizing private investment and public finance is uh, important where there are market failures, especially for large scale deployment of innovative technologies. And for this, we have already um, been developing important projects on um, common European interests, and um, they act as a catalyst for investment. The Portuguese presidency thinks that the deepening and the strengthening of the single market is a very positive um, aspect. So it, it has to go hand in hand with promoting a strategic autonomy in an open European Union. And we have a lot of this debate during the Portuguese presidency. This will be on the agenda at several occasions. And it means um, staying open for global cooperation, business, trade, but defending the interests, the rights and the values of the European Union. So the, the, the aim is to create, to have a level playing field in international trade and its different instruments. Of course, the Portuguese presidency will also um, tackle the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and we will have progress reports on the Competitiveness Council in May, on the 27th of May, and we will organize several events together with the Commission, for example. We will have the Digital Day, the Digital Assembly. We will promote a declaration um, on digital democracy with a purpose, which is a political declaration promoting human-centered digital transition based on ethics and democratic values. And we will put forward as an initiative of the Portuguese presidency. We will have other declarations and other uh, events. Uh, artificial intelligence is also high on the agenda. Uh, the link, the inauguration of an important infrastructure that will link Europe, South America and Africa. This will be launched in, in June. So all this uh, we hope to promote digital in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Norbert Luca Entrup, um, could I ask you uh, now to give your uh, thoughts on um, on the agenda? Um, I mean, Siemens, one of the Siemens areas of activities is a smart construction and smart buildings. This is uh, something we're seeing in the resilience plans uh, as well. How much uh, potential do you see there as being in a, in a, re a renovation wave uh, for digital in order to help create jobs and contribute uh, to the climate goals as well? Thank you. Well. For me, the, the building industry is for me a textbook example of how the objective to become greener and protect the climate goes hand in hand with our goal to drive forward the productivity and the, the digitalization of European industries and, and ultimately to increase competitiveness and, and also create jobs in the end. So why is that? Um, when most people think about a renovation wave, they think about traditional measures like better insulation, better windows or replacing the oil heating with, with a heat pump or whatever. And there's no denying these are all very, very important measures and, and, and Europe should push forward with them. Um, but they will not take us to the very end of truly decarbonizing the building sector. Um, this will require all the tool sets we can, we can muster uh, regarding digitalization. Why is that? Um, we know in principle already today how to build super efficient buildings and, and we have certification schemes available 
that allow building owners and operators to demonstrate to the outside world that their building is performing to the highest standards of efficiency and, and climate protection. Um, so you ask yourself, why don't we do this systematically for all buildings we build? Why don't we apply this also to the, to the install base of, of existing buildings? Um, and the answer is that if you want to really go for such a certification, you're going for a more complex planning. You have to, to go for additional cost in, 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 in covering more complex designs and testing these designs against the green goals you're pursuing. You have stronger and, and, and more, more elaborate documentation efforts. And, and all this is really a barrier to really applying our, 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 our technical gold standards to all the buildings we build. Um, and, and, and how to tackle this is, is really to, to, to use information modeling, building information modeling to ease the work of those designers, of those planners to do this additional workload, to have a digital representation of the building already in the planning phase that allows you to do the certification process, to derive the necessary documentation and so forth. So, so here we have a barrier to overcome, to, to, to bring these cost of building super efficient buildings down um, and make it available to all new buildings that are built. And as a second step, also retrospectively to, to buildings that exist already that, that need a renovation and, and need to be taken to the maximum efficiency level that we can do. Um, a second example, maybe um, later on when we talk about the operations phase of a building. Um, traditionally, buildings have a very simple energy management. So there would be a power line coming into the building and the gas line. Um, and people and, and buildings will just consume what they need. But, but the future here also is very different. Modern buildings have their own power generation, solar panels on the roof. They have a battery maybe in the basement um, and they need elaborate energy management strategies. They need these, these energy management systems need to take decisions. When can they tune down the air conditioning to basically consume or, or get along with what is left in the battery? Um, what is the weather forecast? How, how do they need to plan their energy strategy for the next hours? So all this is, is already pretty much common in larger commercial buildings, uh, shopping centers and so forth. But, but this also needs to become much more mainstream. So uh, bottom line is uh, only with digital tools can we really bring down the building sector to the ultimate goal of true carbon neutrality. Um, and incidentally, this also helps a lot the building sector to become more efficient, to, to get to productivity levels that we see in other industries already today, and to really safeguard the jobs for Europe and, 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 and retain the industrial strength. Thank you very much. Uh, Damien Wurzelager, uh, could we hear some concrete examples of the kind of measures we're, we're trying to think about here when we talk about this digital transition? What are the types of digital investments and reforms that member states should be prioritizing uh, in order to advance the transition? Perfect. First of all, I just want to say um, that it's quite uh, extraordinary, I think, what we have achieved within uh, the RF. I mean, it was part of the negotiation team um, for the for Greens EFA in the European Parliament and um, I mean now for the next three years we have to spend 250 billion euros in climate relevant investments um, I think just to have a, an idea of the number of, of uh, how much money we're talking and 134 billion for digital investments and uh, for me this was a really important point to, to have a clear targets here because I think once we go into this crisis it's clear that and it's very good that we found a European response to invest together because we understood that out of this crisis we can only come if we work together, um, but that we also try to get better out of this crisis than we went in and that, uh, that we don't just invest in anything but in uh, very targeted programs. When it comes to how the money is spent, I mean, I'm not someone who can give you, you know, technology specific uh, answers. I mean, we heard from Mr. Lidke and very good examples of, um, you know, specific building technology that would potentially, you know, not go down to zero in the night in the huge shopping, uh, shopping centers, but like, uh, um, to, to uh, you know, somewhere in between to save energy. But I think from a government perspective, and this is, I mean, where the money now really lies, it's important of how the money is spent. And we, um, I think when you talk about digital, you need to ensure that uh, the money is spent in a way that is interoperable so that you, whenever you get systems that they can be exchanged and that there's a migration possible, that they're open source, um, that basically SMEs and smaller startups have access to the procurement facilities so that 
basically we also foster competition and that there's data protection going on. Um, I think another really important point is that we don't just repackage existing spending. And we can see that, for example, in my member state, uh, Germany, that you know there were already some uh, ideas planned, and now uh, we're just refinancing them with the European money. I think that uh, cannot happen. We need to have additional investments, really strong additional investments that uh, give this additional growth impetus that, that Europe currently so desperately needs. And the really uh, like difficult part to look at is reforms when it comes to digital, because this uh, program is very much about investments on the one side, and there's a lot of money, but it's also about reforms. And uh, I think it's really important that we learn also from this crisis when it comes to institutional resilience, when it comes to uh, yeah, authority resilience, that we are able to digitize our administration in a way that also for future shocks we are, we are willing and able to uh, um, to, to deal with them. So I think uh, when we talk about reforms, it's a, it will be a much more complicated uh, topic to tackle for many countries. Thanks very much. Finally, uh, Jürgen Katainen, um, aside from uh, in investments, what are the kinds of reforms, picking up on that theme of reform, that Europe should be uh, making in order to take advantage of the digital transition? I think you. I think you may be muted. Um, yes, I'm. I'm. I'm always <laughs> more <laughs> so muted than you. usual. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thanks very much for giving me a chance to participate in this very distinguished panel and greetings from very snowy uh, Helsinki region. We have half a meter of fresh snow and minus six degrees. So it's a perfect weather, especially for those who like cross-country skiing. Sounds lovely. So, Definitely not the picture out of my window, I can tell you that in Brussels. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. yeah, actually, I can tell you about our experiences. Citra is a Finnish think, do and connect tank. We, we do classic think tank stuff, but also we use majority of our funds for experimentations and pilots. And one of our pilots was targeted to SMEs to help them to change their business models uh, to use data more. So we were consulting and helping SMEs to use data and, and the, the core of our activity was in changing business models. So as a result of this, uh, we found that lack of competencies, resources and time is one of the biggest challenge or barrier, if you like, for, uh, for digitizing small and medium size enterprises. The management consultant firms and system uh, integrators mainly serve large companies, large uh, customers, and smaller enterprises lack um, uh, latest expertise. So this is one of the proposal I would bring to this panel that uh, there is a need for public-private partnership, bringing together expertise and supporting it with public funds and this could be very helpful for for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, we had a pilot where we had a very typical normal SMEs like a gym chain, small gym chain, hotel, jewel maker, engineering workshop, etc. And they were not uh, software companies; they were just the normal normal companies. And and uh, the feedback was extremely uh, good and valuable and now we are scaling together with public authorities this um, this education program so when you ask what kind of reforms are needed i would say that everything is not about changing legislation it's also about changing uh, the way we we provide help for smes and their public private cooperation is needed. But certainly there's uh, there's um, something, some reforms, especially in the European level, which are desperately needed. And it's the digital uh, market, single market, digital single market. And uh, we are very happy that the current measures under the single European data market is, uh, is doing a good job. So unfortunately, we don't have a digital single market yet in a scale it should be and 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 uh, and all the activities, for instance, enabling health and welfare data to go cross-border is very important for providing a better and level playing field. 
Thanks very much indeed. Um, let me, I, I've, we've started to get questions uh, from the audience for which thank you very much. And let me um, open that to those who haven't asked questions. If you do have questions, please do type them in and send them to us and um, we can select some of those audi audience questions. I've already got one uh, from Gabriela Bajinska from Reuters, which actually chimes with a question I was going to ask. So I'll ask. I'll ask hers, um, and it's addressed to Celine Gower. Um, wh when we talk about bottlenecks for investments, uh, what do you have in mind when describing uh, member states' work on their national plans? I mean, if I would uh, add to that, the, the, this is an enormous amount of money for member states to be spending and absorbing in a very short space of time. And some of these member states, I think of Italy and Spain in particular, have a pretty poor track record of absorbing structural funds. This is a of a whole new magnitude and in a very compressed uh, space of time. So when we talk about bottlenecks, what, what are we thinking of and how, how are member states um, convincing you that they can actually uh, deal with this money in a short space of time? Thank you very much. That, 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 is, uh, that is a really difficult question. Uh, they are, because the bottlenecks are not one, one thing that you can uh, easily identify and then remove and, 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 uh, and, and you solve the problem, but it is a, a myriad of, of, uh, of small things that, uh, that do constitute hurdle for the investment to, 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 um, to touch ground. Uh, let me make so three examples. Procurement. So a lot of this money is going to be spent through uh, through procurement by uh, by um, by member states or by the local uh, by the local level. Uh, you have very good rules on, on on procurement that do favor transparency and, and competition and and provide the best value for uh, for for money. Uh, but you also have uh, an issue of, of the speed at which they can be rolled on the uh, appeal body that will review uh, the result of, uh, of a procurement simply uh, on, on their uh, practical dig digitalization and, uh, and, and, and conduct by, uh, in particular, the local authorities. So updating and, and modernizing the framework for procurement in, at national level, implementing the, the EU rules, is, is a key priority. And, and, and a number of member states uh, have uh, started working on, on that and do include in their plan uh, some very concrete steps uh, to uh, to um, to revise the procurement uh, the procurement framework. Another issue that we that we see in, in all areas and and very much uh, in uh, in digital is permitting authorization and permitting. The fact that you have to in some member states go to three, four, five different uh, administrations to get the necessary permitting to implement some uh, some investments in, uh, in in connectivity or even some investment in uh, in, in buildings. I think that that is a uh, a very serious hurdle. So having systems of, of one-stop shops uh, for, 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 for permitting and, and having also speedier uh, processes by well-trained staff uh, in, uh, in, in the member states is, uh, is a really important, uh, important thing. And, and certainly regulation, to be regulated professions uh, in, in some areas also relevant for, uh, for, for digital services across, and, and particularly uh, cross-border uh, digital services uh, are in some member states uh, still a, a very significant hurdle uh, for, for, for competition and rolling out of, uh, of, of investment on the, on the ground. So these are examples of things that member states are generally completely aware of, uh, struggling themselves with, and, and trying to seize the, uh, the, the recovery plans as an opportunity uh, to, to bring this, uh, this reforms on the, on the ground with very clear target milestones, or sometimes, as we saw in Spain uh, in a few, few weeks ago, anticipating even the adoption of the plan to make sure that when the money comes, uh, it can be uh, spent, uh, spent properly. Thank you. Many of these many of these countries have had this absorption issue for decades, though. Why 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 do we think in the in as I say five minutes five years we're talking about it's a very very compressed space of time. Why do we think that the cultural bureaucratic uh, hurdles that need to be overcome will be overcome in short such a short space of time? Maybe two, two, two points on that. First, what we talk about absorption, I think it's a very different system of managing the funds. I think when we talk about absorption by member states, we're, we're talking about absorption of structural funds that are uh, managed in a very different way than, than the one that, 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 uh, that will apply to, uh, to the facility. I think structural funds, as you, as you know, are uh, essentially spent based on invoices uh, adduced by, by member states showing the actual cost. And all of this costing uh, exercise up front, uh, but also as we go along for having the reimbursement, takes a lot of time uh, by, by, by the member states uh, themselves, and then has to be reviewed by the Commission and then by the Court of Auditors. And that is what explains that, that you know, to a large extent uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the speed of the, of the absorption. Here we're talking about a different uh, instrument. 
which is a performance-based instrument. So the costing is super important, and and review of the costing will be done upfront uh, by uh, by by the member states first, and then by the uh, by the Commission. But once it is agreed, there will not be any checking. Uh, of the uh, of the expenditure before the money is uh, is actually uh, spent, but a check of the performance of the agreed targets and and uh, and milestones that are being being set. Of course, that doesn't dispense the member states to do all the necessary audit and controls uh, on the ground that are necessary, and we're insisting very much on uh, on that. But but in terms of of process and speed of of the spending, uh, I think it's gonna it's gonna make a difference. And my second point is. I think what is at stake? The amount of money that that are uh, sim simply available in some member states take uh, take Croatia. I think this is a the, the highest one. I think we we are really talk, talking double digit of GDP uh, for for Croatia to be absorbed in a very very short uh, period of time. It's a unique opportunity. Uh, member states know that, uh, and and therefore the the uh, the incentive for them to do it is, is is also much much higher because what they know is that any money that has not been properly spent is simply lost in 2026. I think that's kind of a nice incentive to do the things right. <laughs> that's definitely an incentive to spend it, I would agree. Uh, Fernanda Ferreira Diaz, let me ask you, uh, what, what is Portugal doing in order to reform its its uh, its internal systems? I mean, if you address some of the issues that uh, that Celine Gao was talking about, updating, modernizing procurement, the issue of permitting and authorization, regulatory reforms in order to uh, aid absorption, what what are the kind of measures that you're taking uh, in Lisbon in order to address these, um, these uh, absorption challenges? Well, um, I would rather say some examples that we are uh, taking in Portugal, but also that are connected uh, with other European member states, since I'm here representing uh, the Portuguese presidency at this moment. Well, I think that um, I recently read on the study a very interesting sentence that I totally subscribe. It says that Europe must think creatively it must act decisively and uh, it should put cohesion and collaboration at the heart of everything it does. I think that this sentence summarizes very well what needs to be done. And this is also why our motto of the Portuguese presidency is time to deliver for a fair, green and digital recovery. I think this says it all. So, um, I think that we are at a time uh, where well, very challenging, not only um, because we have a new financial framework going on, but we have this pandemic with um, not only the health concerns, but also because we need to overcome its economic and social impact. So um, what I can tell you that we are doing, I think that here uh, the Portuguese government is well aware that we need three things. We need a well-functioning single market, so it's not only Portugal that's at stake, but it's the whole European Union. We need a, a well-functioning single market. Secondly, we need innovation. And thirdly, we need research. So these are three key factors to achieve growth and help uh, our, uh, our businesses create jobs. Of course, like um, Mr. Katainen was saying digitalization of SMEs is uh, key here and public-private par uh, public par uh, partnerships. So uh, what I would like to, to, to tell you as an example is digital skills. Portugal, what, is it, what are we doing? In, uh, we consider that digital skills are an essential component across the three uh, pillars of resilience, climate transition and digital transition. And also, um, Digital skills are uh, at the backbone of Portugal's national recovery and resilience plan. So uh, this has been identified in the Portuguese action plan for digital transition that our government presented last March, March 2020. And it sets a strategic vision for the digital transition structured under uh, several pillars like capacity building, digital inclusion, business digital transformation, digitization of public services. Uh, Celine was just mentioning that uh, member states need to set up one-stop shops and they need to digitalize services and uh, other um, procedures that now are not so 
evident and clear. So Portugal, through its strategic plan, is uh, applying this with measures, with a timeline, and this all connects with Europe because we are setting up a network, a national network of digital innovation hubs, which will connect and be it will be integrated in the European Digital Innovation Hubs Network. And this is to promote um, digital skills for businesses mainly. So this is one example. A second example I can uh, tell you, um, it, it's very interesting. I was participating this week on the first meeting of the um, uh, industrial forum that the Commission set up. And a lot of stakeholders there were saying that uh, governments need to create jobs with quality. And I, I, I found this interesting because this was repeated by several stakeholders. And in fact, they are totally right. COVID-19 has uh, brought many changes to daily life across the EU. Look at us, we are facing each other in a computer screen and not be together in a room. Um, this has brought changes to the work to how we work. And so um, corporate responsibility, business and human rights are very high on the agenda. Companies are asked to take the necessary measures to prevent that their activities from having a, ne a negative impact on human rights. And um, we, we see that this may happen. So at the level of the European Union, Portugal has the intention to start in the first half of 2021 the elaboration of an action plan for responsible um, European business conduct. And at national level, we are already doing that. So we have uh, we are setting up a plan that uh, uh, commits businesses to act responsibly. So this responsible European business conduct will link to the work that is done currently at, at national level in Portugal. Thank you. You mentioned uh, in your answer there digital skills. Actually, we've had a couple of questions now from the audience about digital skills. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. The poll results are in. Um, in terms of the most urgent areas for updating uh, digital spending priorities, um, for digital spending priorities, digital skills and education is far and away the audience's most important priority area, 53%, followed by health systems, modernizing the public sector, renovating the building stock, only 3% work to do for Siemens there in terms of boosting that as a priority, rural co connectivity, 4%, and other 6%. So digital skills seems to be something that people really feel quite uh, strongly about. Uh, and I wondered if I could turn uh, to Yoki Katainen in terms of digital skills. How do you think about uh, upskilling um, when it comes especially to SMEs, but more generally uh, and in your own experience? And what do you think the uh, recovery fund could be, done, could be used for in, uh, in terms of this priority? Yes, indeed. Um, when talking about the skills gap, it's partially um, because uh, companies or entrepreneurs doesn't see clearly how they could change the business model they have. So it's not about that they wouldn't understand the basics of digitalization or they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be able to use all the digital uh, tools they have. But um, when I talk about the digital skill or the skills gap, I mean that we need more um, help or some sort of consultant, consultancy for SMEs to, to help them to rethink their business models. How they can change the way they operate, how they can collect all the necessary data, and how they can use this data for providing better services. That, that's about the digital skill. And as I said in the beginning, there are lots of consultancy firms around in Europe, but they are mostly, or historically, they have mostly uh, concentrated on bigger customer. And and here we need some change. And for instance, this uh, Citrus pilot project is quite good, where public-private partnership has, uh, created, has created new opportunities for SMEs. So Citra gave this pilot project and all the uh, lessons learned to the Ministry of uh, uh, Economic economic affairs and employment 
of Finland and its aim is to use the program to boost the country's economic growth. And the ministry's preliminary goal is that about 4,000 SMEs um, uh, will increase their data economy skills and develop their business operations uh, based on the use of data by 2026. So um, this is uh, how I understand the skill uh, skills gap. Of course, the situation may may change or vary between the member states or the regions. But, um, but just to help SMEs, existing companies, big and small, to, to rethink their business model and the use data. And, and no. uh, my final point is mm. that that for this purpose, we could use this EU facility to provide uh, financing to the new type of uh, consultancy. No, but look, uh, Entrop, how would you address the um, the, the digital uh, skills gap and use and, and leverage the recovery fund in order to uh, address that? Wait, I, you may be, I think you may be muted. We can't hear you. Sorry for that. Um, You're there. Great. I'm back. Yeah. When we talk about digital skills from a company perspective, I mean, there's essentially two sides to consider. One is really the, 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 the drop of the labor market where we recruit new talent. And, and here we all know about the skill gaps that are opening up in certain technical domains like cybersecurity, like artificial intelligence, where we lose talent to other regions, where there is a chronic shortage of talents. And, and, and this is something obviously to be addressed. Uh, but this is well known and publicized, so it's, it's not something new. Uh, the other side of the equation is uh, the constant reskilling that we do with our employees. Um, and, and we clearly recognize the times is over when, when you hire somebody and with a certain skill set, and that skill set is then remaining useful for the next 40 years or so. So, so this is no longer this, this, the case. So we recognize our employees, they, they need a certain understanding of the core technologies that are driving the, the, the disruption and, and, and the development of our markets. So they need to have a foundational understanding of what can artificial, artificial intelligence really do? What can cybersecurity or the lack of cybersecurity do to your company um, and so forth? And, and, and this applies really across the board. So um, of course, our technical guys, our researchers or developers, they need a more profound understanding but even a salesperson um, uh, needs to be able to understand what is going on there. So, so for this, we invest heavily in training. So we, we, we have a three digit budget per year for, for, for reskilling continuously our employees. Here also the way you reskill is transforming. So there's a lot more is delivered now with online courses, with, with virtual trainings and so forth. So there's a lot you can also gain in efficiency and scale to really let everybody benefit from the training offering. Um, but, but this is, of course, something where we can invest as a large corporation, uh, where smaller companies who would need exactly the same, they would probably struggle a lot more. So, so for me, one, one area to look at is uh, how can we really provide the tools, the platforms, the content to our smaller companies in Europe that they can enjoy the same level of reskilling without having to invest on their own in, in, in a platform that, that is sort of costly to run and to maintain. Let me, um, finally, uh, Damien Busselag, I'm going to put an audience uh, question to you, um, which is uh, on the issue of the, the partnerships between the public and private uh, sphere. And um, please do feel free to address the, um, the digital skills area as well, if you want to, in your answer. Um, we have a question from Yussi Makainen uh, in our audience. One challenge in investing in digital is to find a working pivot between the public and private sphere. How can member states find targets for public investment that leverage effectively private uh, investments. Uh, I wonder if you could address how, as you, as you survey the, uh, these uh, plans as they come in and, and examine the potential for the recovery fund, how do you think the public sector can best get private investment to go into digital, uh, digital areas? 
So that's, uh, I think, the, the crucial question, and it's very connected to the digital skills, actually. I was very happy that um, Ms. Diaz was talking about the innovation hubs. Uh, I was also part of the Digital Europe program and was negotiating there. And um, I think what Mr. Katain said also connects very well to that, you know, like we have to somehow uh, regionally uh, make and somehow, you know, make this journey as an SME from being quite analog to digital to maybe even an AI-driven business model. And on this journey, the question is, how can you help best from the public sector perspective? Uh, I recently, not recently, before Corona actually, so even more than a year ago, traveled to um, Sweden uh, to look at their AI strategy. And it's quite interesting because they did exactly that. They did a top-down, bottom-up, if you want, um, a regional strategy, trying to understand what kind of companies do we have in a certain area and what kind of um, universities are around, how can we maybe foster an exchange and they very much build on this idea of uh, regional local innovation hubs. And I think that's definitely something that the, the, private, uh, the, that the public sector can do is bring people together, bring the lawyers on the table that actually help you, you know, uh, navigate through the GDPR and other regulations that might be there and uh, be, you know, helpful in that kind of um, really localized bringing people together. Um, I think I have to say again that it's also very important for the public sector to look at itself and to really ensure that, you know, from the public perspective, we have um, the best service offering that we can have, that, you know, everything is possible digital. We are currently adapting all of us due to the, the recent crisis, and I think we should use this impetus to really think about how to make our administrations uh, function in a better way. I think this digitization then will also change a, a lot of the public sector culture. So I think it's really important to to go through this process. And the last element just on, um, because you said uh, when I scrutinize the national plans, I think uh, one very important part, and uh, Celine and I have been uh, talking about this, is, you know, we from Parliament's perspective, we need to get ready now uh, to also ensure that in the setup of these plans, in the design of these plans, and then in the implementation, we believe that, uh, you know, the best possible outcome is achieved uh, from a European perspective, yeah? so that we really scrutinize and see if uh, the, the plans are adhered to, and also, if I can say that, strengthen the Commission's back a bit when it comes to the one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations with the member states. And so I think it's also a bit of a call to Sam, you, and all the journalists out there to really follow closely um, what's in these plans to ensure that, that they're actually, you know, helping us to, to, to a more digital, more green uh, future in Europe. Um, Celine, let me turn back to you. Um, you. You referred to points of vigilance, which is a very polite uh, way of putting it, but areas where maybe there's more work need to be done in these recovering resilience plans. Of course, I mean, this is an extraordinary amount of money and it could be wasted if we don't see reforms to, attached to it, which is your first point of vigilance. Um, in many countries, these include labour market and pension reforms um, and often very politically unpalatable, unappetizing uh, reforms. Uh, we've seen that obviously the, the pressures that these reforms can create in Italy with the, uh, the political changes overnight. Um, so if you think about the reform process, um, why is it that this is a, an area which, to, you, to, you, to, to, your, to use your words, is, needs to remain a point of vigilance? So you're not seeing enough ambition? I think it's too, too well, first of all, different types of reforms. Uh, we, we, we talk and the regulation talks about a balance uh, between reforms and investments and uh, and the regulation also refers to the CSR as uh, Fernanda was uh, was recalling in the CSR, so country specific recommendations are, are really uh, the compass or the, or the map uh, to uh, to see what has to be addressed by, uh, by the member states. And I think not all reforms uh, are, are the same. Uh, everyone thinks pension reform because they are politically uh, extremely ex extremely charged and, uh, and, and in some countries uh, absolutely important for, for the sustainability of the public finance going, go going forward. But if you if you think about about those plans, it's only in a way one one very limited part of uh, of all the reforms that uh, that have to be uh, that have to be uh, carried on uh, by by the by the member states. And, uh, and and I think there are two uh, two types uh, of reform that are more even more relevant. Uh, the first one is the reforms linked uh, in the uh, or attached to or coming with the investment in the in in the in in, in the plan. Uh, I mentioned permitting uh, earlier, but if, if you if you have uh, an, a deficient permitting system or very cumbersome permitting system, and you want to do a lot of building renovation, then maybe you will you will simply not 
not manage and not achieve uh, the, the, the efficiency that you that you should do. Uh, the same if you want to, to roll out smart grids, uh, if you if you want to roll out uh, digital infrastructure, you will not get there if you're if you're if you're um, um, simply your, your processes and, and and your permitting system do not uh, do not do not function. And those reforms so directly linked uh, to the uh, to the um, to the investment are absolutely essential. Uh, and then we were talking about skills uh, um, before. I think that that is also uh, really important on how you reform the, the link between the, the labor market, the education, and and the innovation uh, community to make sure that the, all of this is much more uh, integrated and that you that you are able to address the uh, skill mismatches uh, that that Norbert was uh, was referring to. So all of this is also reform and also has to be in the in the plan to ensure this uh, this balance. And on that, I think we have a very, uh, very good and very constructive uh, discussion with the uh, with the member states. So we have to be careful about it because it's more uh, it's it's more efforts than just simply uh, finding areas where you can spend the money. Uh, but but this doesn't mean that uh, that I'm worried that it won't happen. I think it will it will happen, and member states understand the the need for that. And the very highly political uh, issues on, on on pensions. Yes, we will have the debate. Uh, but it's uh, it's only one element in, uh, in in plans that are much richer and and, and much more dense than uh, than than that. I mean, in a sense, a country can pledge in their plan very ambitious reforms indeed. Um, when then you come to milestones and disbursements of money twice a year for the, for the come following years, how strict will it be in terms of the link between execution of those reforms and actual payments under the recovery plan? If you look at the regulation, it's very, very strict. Uh, if the milestones and targets haven't been uh, haven't been met, uh, they uh, then the disbursement uh, cannot uh, cannot be made or has to be uh, at least partially suspended. So that is uh, that is very strict, and that's why and that was my my main actually area of, uh, of concern at this stage. So that's why the definition of this milestone and targets, as tedious and detailed as the exercise is, is absolutely essential. Because what we don't want to 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 spend uh, then years arguing with the member state whether a milestone has been met or not. So it has to be sufficiently objective and ambiguous and and clear so that every part of the of the, of, of the contract in a way knows uh, what is expected and and uh, and can confirm that it has been um, that it has been delivered. Of course, I think planning for the five next years is something that that nobody can really do uh, absolute with an absolute degree of, of certainty. So there, there is a possibility also in the regulation to review. Uh, the, uh, the the content of the plan, if absolutely needed, and if it turns to be uh, impossible to implement, but it is really a, a last resort uh, measure that uh, I don't expect to be triggered uh, to triggered a lot. Um, uh, Fernando Ferrer Diaz, I had a question um, from Christopher L Littlefair, um, who's an innovations and Com communications manager at Sony, asking about uh, artificial intelligence in particular when it, when we talk about. Uh, the digital transition. Um, what concrete initiatives um, do you envisage in order to promote AI? And is there a feeling of fear or a feeling of opportunity when it comes to AI? Obviously, it's an area which can be ex enormously disruptive to people's lives. So how do you balance, in a sense, the, uh, the disruption with the economic opportunity? Well, uh, we don't need to be afraid of AI. Um, in fact, we need to combine all these reforms that have been um, discussed here in this panel and um, discuss these digital skills, upskilling, reskilling. So this all together will link uh, people and the uh, businesses with the capacities to keep up with the pace of uh, technology. And I, I'm, I, I would like to profit here to, to tell you that um, as far as innovation is concerned, I'm proud to say that Portugal integrates the group of member states in the European Innovation Scoreboard 2020 um, in the group of strongly innovative countries, along with countries like Germany, France, Austria, Estonia, Ireland and Belgium, so it's the on, only southern uh, European country to be in this group. So I'm proud to, to say that too. But coming back to the question, artificial intelligence covers a wide range of sectors. It covers from economy to defense, uh, internal security, justice, transport, agriculture, cl health, climate. We are um, dealing, we, we are implementing lots of uh, very interesting projects, for example, in the agro-food 
sector in Portugal uh, using AI. Um, AI is not the responsibility, uh, direct responsibility of the Ministry of Economy and Digital Transition that I represent, but from the Ministry of Silence. So I do not, we, we, we conduct uh, at national level uh, a strategy on AI, but I cannot tell you many details. I would like to tell you nevertheless that what I referred previously, um, the, the, the link and the inauguration of a cable, an infrastructure cable, which is foreseen to be inaugurated in June 2021, and it will link um, Europe, Africa and South America, this will be a European data gateway platform strategy. So it, it, it will allow um, us to reinforce and expand this interconnect infrastructure, and it will allow us to, um, to, to, to address data that is needed, so much needed for intel artificial intelligence in a more connected way. So uh, in, in a sense that Artificial intelligence is um, is inevitable, and of course, a lot of projects are being dealt with already. We at national level also have a strategy on that, like many other countries. Um, at European level, much is being done. I cannot tell you in detail because it's not me personally who follows that, but I think I think that. Um, we, we have to, to, to trust and this and for this we have this Lisbon declaration, um, a human centric with digital as a democ democracy digitality with a purpose. So that's what I referred previously, all this interlinked and connects as well with AI. Thank you. Uh, Damien Buslag, when you when you speak to your voters um, and I'm Panel, just to let you know, we only have three minutes left, so please keep your answers now quite, quite, um, quite brief. Um, when you speak to constituents about AI, what's your sense of, of of how people view it? Is it seen as an opportunity, or do they see it as a threat? I think it's always a bit both. You need to somehow address the concerns of people for them to be able to adopt uh, AI. So I think it's really important that we take privacy concerns seriously. That we take all the other issues of uh, you know losing your data as also a company um, seriously and so on and then and, and discrimination that can also happen with ai and then we have uh, a huge potential uh, to use the innovative power of ai um, in, in a positive way i think one big concern that i hear a lot from companies and then i'll stop as well is that currently uh, if you want to build for example an ai on your cloud infrastructure you can build only on three large uh, providers, if you want to say. And so I think it's really important that also when we think about how to spend all this new money, that we ask for you know, interoperability and public procurement to work in a way that allows for, for smaller access to take place as well. Norbert, look at Entrep I'm going to change the topic slightly for, your, for, for my last question to you, which is uh, really framed around the fact that obviously Siemens is a pretty vast company. And yet uh, in the digital arena, we see really not that many uh, world-class world uh, digital enterprises which are European. Um, it's a, it's a long-running concern, obviously, uh, in Europe. And I just wondered, first of all, why do you think this, uh, this is obviously an extremely difficult question to answer in a short space of time, so I, forgive me for that. Why is it Europe has struggled so, so, um, so, so, so prodigiously when it comes to, to scaling up um, world-class digital companies? Uh, and what is the opportunity now when you look at things like the Recovery Fund and the digital uh, transition that Europe is now trying to embark on? What, what's the opportunity to change that narrative? I'll do the why part very shortly. Um, um, Europe has lost the, the digital race in the consumer space. It's plain and simple. You can argue about the reasons. Um, uh, maybe it was a, a too strong regulatory caution uh, Whereas in countries like the US, Google was basically left free to run and, 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 and worry later about the consequences. I, I would like to focus on the opportunity here because we still have an industrial space. Um, and that space is, uh, is not as digitized as the consumer space is. So when we look at us consumers, we all have our profile, our buying behavior stored in a cloud. And somebody out there can shoot a targeted advertisement at you because they know you sometimes better than you own your, than you know yourself. Um, 
in an industrial space, it's not that easy. Um, but but we don't have yet the same profiles for industrial infrastructure for machines that allow us to optimize those machines. Um, why is that? Because it's a more complex. We're not dealing here with one standard consumer that you can basically apply the same business model to all over the world. We are talking about different machines in different industries. Um, uh, so it's more complex and it's also uh, in terms of business modeling a different game. You can't shoot advertisements at machines. You, you don't have a mechanism to, to make a secondary commercial use of the data you collect. So it, it's, there's, there, there's no advertising model here or whatever. Um, so it, it's just a very different game. And, and my, 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 what I would really ask for also when we, when we design our rescue package is uh, first in, to consider that. That, that first we have a different arena here, but also that this is yet a wave to come. Most of the data in industry space are not yet really beneficially used in contrast to consumer space. So this is where Europe can still gain the second half of the match, so to say, or win the second half of the match, uh, also using the industrial base and industrial know-how that, that we have in, in, in a very great depth and detail. Thank you. Final word to you, Joki Katainen. How do you assess the, the the potential here for Europe to to actually um, make up for the uh, the uh, the lost ground when it comes to uh, creating world class digital uh, high tech companies? Well, um, we may have lost the game when we talk about uh, platform companies, but it's not the whole truth we have two big opportunities. The first one is the existing manufacturing companies. Some of them are highly digitalized, some are not yet. So I, I would put the emphasis on that. The second option is uh, to digitalize public services. Public sector's role in Europe is much higher than the one in the United States. And the more we can connect digital technologies and new business models to, to provide better uh, public services to our citizens, the more it can promote digitalization and increase productivity and the quality of the services. So, so those are the focus areas to which I would, would concentrate much more on. Thank you very much. Well, it may or may not be a, a Hamiltonian moment, but it's obviously a huge opportunity for the European Union. <clears throat> this recovery fund and the digital area, as we've been hearing, is, is an absolutely critical part of that. Um, very, very helpful and fascinating contributions from all our panelists. Uh, if we were able to applaud, I would ask you all to applaud, but we can't, so um, maybe applauded virtually. Um, and thank you very much, panelists, for your time uh, this morning. We now go to a, uh, again, virtual networking break. Um, and then after that, we have the opportunity of hearing from the uh, EU's ambassador to the United States, uh, Stavros Lambrinidis, um, who will be speaking to us at quarter to 12 in, in just under, just over 10 minutes time. So thank you very much indeed again to, to my panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you.